What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Internal Leverage Podcast, where we explore the mindsets, habits, and routines of high performance. Our next guest has been quoted in the Ireland's national newspaper as a big city hitter for his success in the financial world. Doug Gordon is a high performance coach for CEOs and professional athletes, and he's also a Dublin radio show host where he's interviewed thought leaders like Dr. John D. Martini, Lisa Nichols, and Jack Canfield. In this episode, we speak about his background in finance, where he grew a business from $50 million in revenue to $1.75 billion. We talked about his near-death experience, which woke him up to his spiritual nature, and the way that he works with his clients to help them to optimize their mindset, energy, and performance. It's an amazing episode. Check it out. So, Doug, really appreciate you bring, being, being here with us today. It's an absolute pleasure. Thank you for having me on. So... Let's dive a little bit into your story because it's really, it's a pretty fascinating one. And I think the very first time that I met you, we were in a room and, uh, and, you, and you told your story and I said, that's amazing. <laughs> so tell us a little bit about your background and then let's get into your, your experience, your NDE experience that you had. Sure. Yeah. So I spent 21 years in the investment world, basically selling hedge funds and mutual funds, B2B, some of the biggest banks, financial institutions and stockbrokers in the world based out of London mainly. Um, so I worked my way up from customer services to sales, to sales manager, sales director, to head of sales and marketing. And um, during that time period, obviously got to meet uh, some amazing people and was obviously a trained fund manager, trained investment advisor as well. So I got to sit in with uh, analyst meetings where fund managers were interviewing some of the best uh, CEOs, CEOs and CFOs in the world. So you got to learn what works and what doesn't work within business. Um, and it was all going swimmingly well until 2008. We, we all remember when the, the bottom fell out of the market and um, a lot of people lost a lot of money. And when I was at this particular company, I won't mention their name, but you can work it out to go on my LinkedIn. I was uh, working with the team where we had something like 3.3 billion in hedge fund sales uh, assets, which just walked out the door because of the Madoff incident and also obviously September uh, 2008. And at that point, you know, people were being laid off left, right and centre. I was watching people walk out with boxes in their hands, you know, good friends and being quite empathic towards other people's energies. I got really stressed myself. And after um, a little while, I started getting you know, stress related ailments, you know, and, and saw doctor after doctor, specialist after specialist, uh, ended up having two operations at the end of 2009 that went wrong. And then for the next three years, I was waking up sometimes 10 times in the night with abdominal pains, like I was being punched in the stomach. Uh, it was so bad, it affected me, it affected my marriage, it affected my job as well. And uh, actually now, because of that, or not just because of that, but one of the reasons that is I, I'm no longer married to that person. Um, and then in 2012, when I just thought, you know, nothing could get any worse. Uh, ironically, I had a, it was one of my best years in, in the industry. Um, I'd basically grown that business in six years from 50, 50 million per annum sales to 1.75 billion per annum sales, um, which is great. But at the end of that year, in 2012, I ended up getting the norovirus, which is like a stomach bomb. And after 10 days of serious dehydration, uh, basically where my electrolytes were down to almost zero, um, I was rushed to hospital with heart uh, orientated issues and the ECG in the ambulance at heart, blood pressure doubled. I arrived into A&E and, you know, in a state of absolute stress and worry. Um, and then looking at the blood pressure kit, like 250 over whatever it is, when it's normally like 115 over 70, I was like, oh my God, this is it. And uh, I was put on one of those gurneys and I was run down to uh, x-ray because uh, they thought there was going to be a blockage or something like that in the, uh, in the stomach. And on the way down to x-ray, um, suddenly the lights came on and I was encapsulating this amazing feeling of love, energy and connection, nothing like I'd ever felt before. I mean, if you take your best orgasm and times over by about 30, you might just about get there. Um, but at that point, you know, I, there was no man with a beard, but there was a kind of a loving, living, conscious energy that was surrounding me that I was connected with, which was internally within me, um, which was phenomenal. So at that point, obviously, I, I realized having a near death experience and, you know, I came back. Otherwise, I wouldn't be speaking to you now um, and um, came back with a kind of a mission to try and change. And initially, I didn't know what to do. I went and did a church course. And while I was doing the church course, they were talking all about Jesus. And obviously, I believe in Jesus and I'm very much into Christianity. But at the time, I kind of felt like, you know, that because of being encapsulated, that amazing feeling of love, I felt that that love energy would never discriminate or alienate against anybody in this world. And that like religions are like rivers to the sea. They're all beautiful in their own right. Uh, as long as you get to the sea, it doesn't matter though which one you go down, the sea being God, universal energy, Allah, whatever you believe in, it doesn't really matter. 
as long as love is the main thing that most of these religions are trying to get us towards love peace and harmony um, and i told them that and they said well maybe that might be something more like buddhism or something like that maybe you should look at another avenue and i walked out and i actually said to the universe i kind of put it out there i said look give me a sign and two days later after helping a friend of mine with cancer i was running uh, with my dog because i used to play national league uh, premier league hockey and uh, my dog tripped me up, went flying over the dog, landed down, cut my hand and my knee to shreds, blood all over the place. And um, when my cuts kind of healed the next day, I looked at them and I had um, in cuts, no, I've still got the photos. I, I had like an eight, an eight and an eight on my knee. Thank God it wasn't 666. And between the two eights of my hand, I had the letters of the cross, I-N-R-I. -I. And it was big I, big N, small R, small I. So it's like saying, Jesus of Nazareth here, not really King of the Jews, but get the luck back and do that course. So I kind of thought, okay, fair enough. I went back, did the course, got into the, you know, the religious thing to begin with, read half the Bible, went to Bible classes, all that kind of stuff. And then, um, but still felt that rivers to the sea thing. And uh, so I started studying other things as well, got into more spirituality, then got into healing to heal myself because of the ailments I had, uh, became a master teacher for five medals of healing. And uh, then because of the mind body connection, then became a life coach because of that. Um, then because of the 21 years in the investment world and managing people, got on stage, doing business coaching as well. And then got a radio show. A radio show went from zero to 140,000 live listeners every week. And I've had people like Jack Canfield, Lisa Nichols, Stephen Covey, uh, Dr. John D. Martini, and many others on the show as well. Wow. That's a lot. I mean, obviously, you know, that's a lot. And the way you present it, though, is, is like... Yeah, you know, I just went down and got some milk and came back, right? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. it, it's it's fascinating, it's impressive. And I, I think what's really interesting to me and what, the reason why I resonate with you so much is because I'm very much interested in these two worlds, right? The world of, of business and the marketplace and, you know, where where we spend our time and what, what makes this world move around, what makes society move as well as the spiritual traditions. And as you can see, I got the Buddha behind me and I have a very sort of minimalist kind of look here that reflects my, my vibe. You know, I've spent a lot of time living in uh, ashrams and, you know, meditating in, in monasteries and things like this. And I'm very interested in, in the intersection of these two, what would otherwise be disparate worlds. And I really love how, you know, you come from the world of business and you've, you've done a, a lot in, in a business, you know, setting. And yet you also ha have this really uh, powerful spiritual tradition as well in the way you weave those two together. Would you agree? Yeah, totally. Um, I think, you know, everything in this world is energy. In this universe is energy, right? So I always say thoughts are energy. Speech is energy. Thoughts lead to speech, speech leads to actions, actions leads to habits and habits lead to destiny. So start with a positive thought and end with a positive destiny. And even in the monetary world and commerce and business and everything like that, money is just energy. It's an exchange for doing something for someone else. So everything that is to do with energy affects the entire planet in all ways or forms. Um, so I try and bring the two together in terms of making sure that people can optimize their energy to optimize their performance in business and in life as well. And, you know, people talk about productivity and time management and everything like that. That's fine. But actually, the most important thing is if that you're in the optimal state in terms of energy, you will get more done in less time with less stress. And that's what I do. And that's how I help CEOs and I help, you know, sports people, executives, anybody, even children I've helped um, to make sure that they are in the best optimal state of their energy um, but also with obvious other things as well in terms of business coaching as well, which I talk about a lot. I teach people presentation skills because I think, you know, the power of your voice is so important because we all have something to communicate with the world. We all come down here with a mission in life, a purpose in life. And I think the real aim in life is to find that true purpose, to connect with your true self, to connect with your true purpose and go out and live that and share that with as many people as possible. And I always say, I always say, put your thinking cap on. You know, create a vision, create a plan. Uh, this is my acronym, create a vision and create a plan and communicate that vision with other people to create connection in order to collaborate with them in a communicative manner. And secondly, A is for aligning your mission with other people as well, but having the awareness of where you are, what you're looking to achieve and where they are and what they're looking to achieve as well as a team. And then finally, P is for purpose and also for passion. 
and um, you know, passion is you know, it's all about enthusiasm, it's all about energy. Uh, but and then purpose creates that sometimes as well, because, you know, when you have a love for what you do a love for the people around you, a love for your product or service and a love for the clients that you're dealing with, I always say love is an acronym for lots of vibrant energy. You will create so much more efficiency, productivity, better time management and a more enjoyable, loving job uh, and loving team and loving organization um, in terms of what you do. And I think this is paramount in all businesses. Um, now, you can either get people into that, you know, in state and finding what their true mission is in life, or you can create a sense of purpose around what you're doing. And one of the best ways of doing that is to understand what does your business do and how does it affect the end customer? So, for example, I was working in an investment management company and um, one of my staff came up to me, he was an IT guy, and he said, Doug, I'm fed up. You know, all I do is solve IT problems all day. I just, you know, I'm not interested in what I'm doing. I don't feel like I've got a sense of purpose. And I said to him, I said, Chris, have a look at what we do as a business. We help people in terms of that granny or grandpa, you know, buy a better home, have a better holiday, give more to their children, their grandchildren, give more to charity. Basically what we're doing by outperforming the index, outperforming the benchmark, we are creating better lives for people. Uh, and while you are helping that, because every single day, every time you solve one of those IT issues, you help us make sure that we can do our you know, research online better, our deals more efficiently, our valuations more efficiently, and send out you know, money to the clients more efficiently as well. So every single time you solve one of those problems, you're actually making someone's life better. And when you can understand what your product does and how it makes the end customer have a better life in some way or form, it gives you a real sense of purpose in here rather than just in here. And you can actually, you know, collectively collaborate much better as a team in a sense of purpose uh, mm -hmm. when they all feel that. Even a secretary, even a secretary helping you in terms of, you know, you go, getting you traveling because of your inspirational speaks and everything like that and your coaching. If she knows that what you're doing is affected by her work, she feels more fulfilled by it as well. Interesting. So there's more ownership and that really addresses what Carl Marx talked about, this idea of alienation. Right. When a person feels alienated from their work, that's when they start to, to cave in and the life goes out and all that enthusiasm sort of dries up. Right. hundred percent. Yeah. hundred percent. And I think, um, you know, so many people go into businesses just you know, for the paycheck and there's so much more about life. I mean, you know, I've been given bonuses and, you know, promotions and all that kind of stuff in my career. And that's fine for the ego, but Really, for a sense of true purpose for your higher self, you need to be learning, evolving and growing and be able to utilize what you learn, grow and evolve from to teach other people, to give you a sense of helping others as well. Because one of the greatest gifts you can give is giving a gift to other people in terms of your time, your love and your knowledge as well. So when you sit down with a CEO who's, you know, maybe the head of a, you know, nine figure or even a 10 figure organization, do you start talking about your experience of being surrounded by light and love, or do you have a different approach? Like, how do you, how would you have a conversation with somebody who doesn't really have as much exposure to, to that side of things? Yeah, I, I wouldn't necessarily talk about, you know, my near death experience unless they asked. Um, a lot of them know about it because I put it up on my, my LinkedIn and I've done talks about it obviously uh, all over the world. Um, but generally, I, I don't talk much about myself. I talk about them. And, you know, I'll give you an example. So Angus Hegarty is a super guy, one of the best uh, leaders in the world that I know. He's the president of Dell. And um, I work with Dell, SVP, VP, and executive director level in terms of coaching. And when I approached him a couple of years back, um, you know, I... I Basically, he, was got, he got promoted, I can't remember, from looking after 120 countries to 180 or whatever it was, doesn't matter. And I said to him on LinkedIn, I said, Ingus, congratulations. And it was fantastic to see you've done so well. If there's anything I can do, could I help you? I'd love to meet with you. And here's a video of me speaking recently at the National Workplace Wellbeing Conference in Ireland. You know, have a look. And within like 10 minutes, he got me you know, involved with his secretary. We set up the meeting. I went in to see him. Uh, but before I went in to see him, I made sure that I'd done all my research on him, you know, to gain knowledge about him. Um, because, you know, the most important thing in terms of dealing, in terms of business, is to understand, you know, what is the other person interested in? What, what, what are their needs? And can you help them in terms of getting what they want? Uh, so, for example, I looked and, you know, he's, the, he's, an, he's an inspirational guy, this guy, right? So he is uh, the president 
of the American Chamber of Commerce over here. He's also um, on the lead committee, I think he's the head of the committee, of the um, uh, Special Olympics Committee as well. And uh, he's also a rugby fan. He's got two kids. Um, he's a remarkable presenter. I, I looked at him present. Lots kind of, so when I went in there, I didn't talk about anything about my near-death experience or anything. Like, I just talked about him and matched things that I'd done to him. So like he was the he's the president of the American Chamber of Commerce. In the previous year, I'd spoken at the European Chamber of Commerce, the Junior Chamber of Commerce, the Dublin Chamber of Commerce, the Tanzanian Chamber of Commerce. So I said to him, look, if you ever want me to speak at the American Chamber of Commerce, I'd happily do it for you, you know, to help you out. Um, so it was creating a connection between the two of us of common interests. And then on terms of the Special Olympics Committee, um, I'd been a, an ambassador for the um, Wooden Spoon, which is a Six Nations, which is the rugby, Six Nations uh, charity to help mentally and physically handicapped children. And, um, you know, we help them in all ways and forms. So I was talking about that as well. So it was about creating connection between myself and the CEO, because at the end of the day, the CEO may be earning six, seven, eight figures, whatever. But at the same time, he's still a person. He's still got interests. He's still got loves. He's still got a family. And it's really connecting on that basis and then showcasing, if you want to showcase how good you are, don't tell anybody how good you are yourself. Utilize references and testimonies uh, from other people to showcase how good you are. And that's exactly what I always do. I always show, I've got 50 uh, LinkedIn con uh, uh, testimonies um, from real people with real results. And I tell them, I said, please contact these people. Um, because there's so many people on Instagram and Facebook that, you know, they pay people for videos to get testimonies and all this kind of stuff. But mine are all from real results. Um, so I utilize that to, you know, promote what I do rather than talk about how good I am myself. Well, you, you know, I, I've seen you in action connecting with people on, on the Clubhouse app. And so I know that you're all about authentic, you know, human and powerful connection. Would you say that there's a, a dearth of connection in the world, both you know, personally, but also professionally in some of the spaces that you've been in. In what sense do you mean, Abraham? Just explain that. Well, yeah, I mean, a, like a lack of connection between people. Um, uh, no, I, I think maybe there, there is connection, but sometimes in business, it can be a connection on an ego sense. Mm -hmm. You know, quite often people go into organizations or they go into, uh, you know, they might go to a conference and they might meet someone they know in terms of a client or something like that. And they're not really actively listening to the other person. They're just right. waiting for their, their bit to say. And I think the greatest gift you can give another person is your presence. And that's why they call it the present moment. And, you know, if you can really listen and give them two ears and really actively listen to what they say, uh, which I know you do, because I've heard you on, uh, on Clubhouse, um, it's much more than just trying to outdo them with the, you know, something that you've done that's better than what they've done to try and impress them. What really people want to be done uh, to have is to be listened to and to give them that ear. And then if you can give them that ear, listen to what they need and try and help them get what they need, then you'll create true connection an authentic connection. And that's what I aim to do. Right. And it, I mean, that's fascinating to me. I was just telling a story yesterday that I always thought, well, my superpower is listening and asking questions, which means, uh, you know, I could be a professional dinner guest, but that doesn't really <laughs> pay very much. So how do I, you know, what can I do with that? But then the whole, you know, there's a side of business that's all numbers, but there's another side that's all personal, right? Especially in the realm of sales. I mean, sale, a sales conversation is a, is a intimate and personal conversation where you do exactly what you just explained, right? You listen to the person's problems, what it is that they want, what they're looking to achieve. And, and you, you, create a way how you can help them how you can serve them and for you that led to an increase up to 1.75 billion you know in, in sales when you were working in corporate so so yeah i mean it's it's absolutely fascinating again the the sort of the interplay of of the marketplace but then also people skills and then of of course the, the interpersonal and spiritual absolutely yeah no i think you know you're right. In terms of sales, it, it, it's interesting. So I got it. I'm 46 now. And I got into sales when I was 22. And I realized when I look back now, I've actually been doing quasi coaching for over 20 years. Because in those meetings, in those hour meetings that I'd have with clients, obviously, once you get to know them, and you go back and see the same clients over and over and over again, in terms of customer services and, and relationship building, um, 
you tend to talk about the business and the sales for half the meeting, but the other half of the meeting, a lot of the time, it's amazing how many clients would start asking me questions. You know, oh, I've got this issue with my you know, you know, team member. What do you think? Or, you know, I'm trying to get this new client. What do you think? Or even with their own wives, you know, I've got this issue with my own wife. What do you, and so I, I literally became a coach at the age of about 23 um, without even realizing. And it's a pleasure. And I think the reason why I was so successful in sales is because I genuinely wanted to help people. I genuinely wanted to make friends with these people long term. And I wasn't looking for the quick sale. And the biggest tip I'd given anybody in business is to develop long term strong relationships with people and don't try and sell to them. When, when I went in to see Angus Hegarty, the president of Dell, I didn't expect to get in there straight away. I didn't have that intention. My energy, my intention when I went in there was to make friends with this guy because he's a very influential businessman within Dublin. And at least if I came out there and anyone said to him, you know, what do you think of Doug Gordon? He would say, yeah, super guy, really like him. And that was my only intent. And I think that should be the intent of every single meeting you have is to create long term friendships with people um, so that, you know, they're, they're genuine and authentic. And that's what I always do. And people can feel that in the energy of and when they can feel that in the energy. They want to do business with you more than you just trying to get a quick sale out of it. Yeah. I like to say that, you know, there's two types of people in the world. There's the vacuum cleaners that suck. <laughs> and we all know what it's like to be around people like that. You feel drained. And then there's the fire hoses who are able to fill their own cup so that they're overflowing. And that's what I'm getting from you. I'd love, love, love to take a look at uh, what are some of your tips for, uh, you know, the, we, we spoke about mindset, right? We spoke about the idea that everything is energy. And I, I love that concept. And, and I'm, I'm like, I'm chewing on it still. Um, but also, you know, since you are a performance op optimization coach, the habits and routines of high performance. How do you work with your CEO clients in order to create greater levels of performance? Is there a certain lifestyle that you prescribe or, or, or things that people should be doing on a daily basis? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah. So um, I love my acronyms, right? So I, I gave you the, the cap one earlier on. Um, one of the things in my book, my, my new book's coming out, which is High Performance Success Without Stress, or basically stepping into the best version of yourself. And uh, in the book, I base the book around my model of make, uh, which is make it happen, uh, whether it be make, a, you know, a, a make sales, make a perfect business, make a perfect relationship, um, whatever. You can use make for anything virtually. And um, it's basically made up of firstly, M is from mindset, as we just mm -hmm. discussed. And mindset is so important in terms of getting people into what we call the flow. McKinsey right. had done a study, study in flow showing that people in the flow are 500% more productive. Um, you know, I think Forbes magazine did a, uh, an article a couple of years back saying that uh, happier staff were 20% more productive, happier salespeople, 37% more productive, excuse me. And uh, the Fortune 100 magazine did a, a, an example showing that uh, the top 100 places to work for in terms of happy factor, uh, stock market returns went up 14% between 1997 and 2004. Wow, really interesting. But the ones outside... Uh, only went up 5%. So um, averaged. So it just shows you the difference between a happy uh, environment can produce, you know, something that economically affects the entire world. And in mm -hmm. fact, if you have a look, you know, the last two weeks of the year in terms of the, the, the Christmas season uh, or the day before Independence Day, the day before Easter or the day before Thanksgiving, 85% of the time stock markets go up. And that tells you that people are in a happier state and they're in a more positive state and more positive things happen because of like attracts like. So that's mindset. Um, a is for actions and activities. So and just um, on that point, the sorry to interrupt the, yeah. the, the happiness factor. Is that because there's like, for instance, there's more serotonin floating through the body. And then we, when we have more serotonin, we're more open to, for instance, taking risks. We feel more emboldened. Is that more or less? The yeah, but you will. Right. Very much so, but you also, if you're happier, obviously you tend to have more energy. You, you tend to be more enthused about what you're doing, uh, but you also, you tend to, because your energy, like serotonin, yeah, absolutely. Because you're, 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 you've got that happy factor, you tend to be more aware and more alive and more alert, uh, so you make better decisions as well, um, because there's more energy. So yeah, happiness, again, comes down to the energy that you have within, uh, the focus that you have within, the discipline that you have within. And let's face it, if you're doing something you enjoy, you tend to be much more disciplined in doing it, 
Whereas if you're doing something that you don't enjoy, you tend to be a bit lackluster at times as well. So that's why mindset is so, so important in getting in so you can focus on what you want rather than what you don't want. Yeah. Um, a is for actions or activities, you know, in terms of understanding where you are and what you're looking to achieve. In a business sense, you know, it's incredibly important to make sure that obviously you've done some kind of business plan and put targets in place for the year, obviously, but then obviously for the quarter, the month and the week and put daily systems, processes and procedures in place leading towards those targets. Um, then also obviously client mapping so you can understand who your true avatar is and then activity mapping in terms of um, time management and making sure you're spending the right time with time for the right people and getting the right tasks done at the same time. Uh, K is for knowledge, know your client, know your product, know your industry and match your client needs to your USCPs but also have a knowing faith in yourself in terms of knowing exactly what you want and knowing that you're going to get it regardless of the ups and downs in life. Mm -hmm. And then finally E is for energy and enthusiasm which we obviously already talked about. So that would be one of my things. The other thing I say to people in terms of, I truly believe that we come into this world as a being of love, uh, a light worker, uh, and that we should gleam our light. And my gleam acronym is have gratitude for everything you do during the day. Because where you have gratitude for even the smallest things, you open yourself up to feel worthy enough to receive more. L is for learning. Uh, learn, try and learn something new every day because when you learn something new you tend to have a sense of growth in you uh, and a sense of evolution as well and then um, E is for exercise um, you know you have this one body so honor it as best as possible you look like you're in pretty good shape and um, you know I try and do a, you know, a decent amount of exercise myself as well to keep my mind uh, you know in, in the best possible state and my body as well and then A is for awareness or also I like affirmations as well. Awareness of, you know, what programs are you playing in terms of your parental programs? Because we all are products of our parents or preachers or right. teachers in our past relationships, right? right? So sometimes they can, you know, hold us back through, you know, maybe holding on to energy blocks such as lack of forgiveness, guilt, uh, anger, resentment. And if we can get rid of these, I've actually got a program in my book and also in my coaching program to be able to get rid of these, um, you know, energy blocks in terms of parental programs. And then finally, M is for uh, meditation. And it's not just about, obviously, like yourself, I do a lot of meditation. I, I have my own meditations, which I give out to people. Um, and it's not just about meditating to reduce stress. It's also about meditating to visualize uh, the steps, the procedures and the process in terms of your goals and where you want to go. And it's amazing when you meditate and visualize those steps how much more easily they tend to flow when you're actually doing them. Right, beautiful. That's the process of neuroplasticity is creating those, those neurological uh, pathways, right? The neural pathways. So that becomes much, much easier when we're in the action. I absolutely love that. I'm curious about the, the point that you, you kind of, you touched on it. You said that you have a training uh, to help people to release, you know, our, uh, I guess the, the scripts that we were raised with, right? That were handed down through generations, whether our parents or preachers, teachers. Um, is that something that you can divulge in a short amount of time? Yeah, I'll give you a very short version. It includes, um, now you need to do this with a coach. And the reason why you need to do it with a coach is because it's exactly the same as when people go to Alcoholics Anonymous, they are made stand up in front of the crowd and say out in front of the crowd, I am an alcoholic but I accept that and I'm willing to change. And the reason why they do that is because without awareness for one and then acceptance of a trait, secondly, you can't change. And by doing it and saying it out loud in front of someone else, you're triggering three parts of the brain, including the subconscious to allow that change to happen. And, and the procedure works. I've had, you know, uh, six foot four um, uh, American football players, actually one who works for uh, Salesforce in Dublin, in this very room, uh, crying his eyes out because he had a real breakthrough in terms of this uh, exercise. So it's, it really does work, it's amazing. Uh, and when I did it actually myself, it, I did it with someone else, it, it, I did cry as well. Um, anyway, um, so basically what it is, it's all about awareness, it's all about understanding, you know, firstly, what your own awareness in terms of what are the uh, plays that you are doing in terms of parental programming. So they could be stuff like uh, not feeling worthy, uh, of love or worthy of success, uh, lack of self-love, um, not actively listening, as we talked about earlier on, um, egotistical, uh, fearful, uh, many others like this. I'm sure like we could, the list could go on and on and on. And to write those down on a piece of paper and be honest with yourself, even if it's slightly in you, write it down. Then secondly, have a look at the people around you in your life uh, and pick five people who test you in some way or form. They don't have to be in your life now, they could be in the past and write down their traits that you see in them that you don't like or don't serve them in some way or form. 
and then have a look at those five people and see if there's any commonality between the five people. And if there is, own it. It'll be in you as well. Because people who come into our lives generally mirror back the areas that we need to self-improve on ourselves, if you look at it in a spiritual context. And if you utilize that, then that can be very, very powerful. And then finally, something I learned in Kabbalah is um, to phone a friend and phone a friend and say to them, look, I'm doing this ego exercise to self-improve. I want you to tell me everything that you don't like about me or anything you don't think that serves me. And I'll take my ego out of it, my emotions out of it. And I'll look back in as the observer and I'll just take everything down on a piece of paper with love. And at the end of it, I won't retort at all. I won't say anything at all. I'm just going to give you a hug if we're in the same presence or I'll just thank you if we're on the phone and I'll walk away and no more will be said. And then I'll actually not look at it for three days and then I'll, I'll look at it then and reflect. And what you do, so then you add all these again to the, to the paper as well. So you get your self-aware views, your mirror views and your phone a friend views on this piece of paper. And then what you do is you voice them out loud in front of a coach and you voice them with passion, with your hand and your heart coming from a real space of intention and energy with the intention to get rid of these. And once you've done that and you've done it with real passion, then rip the piece of paper up into shreds, throw it in a fire, throw it down the toilet, feel that energy flushing away. Then rewrite another set of I am statements of the opposites. So I am worthy of love. I am successful at everything I do. I am listening with love. Uh, I am always caring for myself as well as the others. I'm always listening to others with love. All these kind of things, whatever you need to write down. And then say these twice a day uh, for 21 days minimum. And I generally say them three times. So I would say, you know, I am always listening with love. I'm always listening with love. I'm always listening with love. And I would say it with my hand and my heart, looking at myself eye to eye in the mirror and say it with passion. And, um, and then I have another, I'm not, I haven't got time to go through it, but I have another uh, meditation technique, which goes hand in hand in that as well, um, you know, to make it, you know, even more uh, energetically powerful. Um, and then the ongoing process after that, once you've done that, is to have a look at the situations that you're in in every single day in terms of interactions with other people and understand, you know, what thoughts you're having in those situations, what behaviors were you putting in those situations, and what emotions, energy emotions, did you have in those situations? And what served you and what didn't serve you? And then write down what, if you were your godlike self, your perfect self, you should have thought, you should have behaved like, and you should have felt as well in terms of emotions. And if you do that on an ongoing basis, you create, again, awareness, and then you can create change. So you're really helping your clients to develop that metacognition, that ability to really be aware of one's thoughts and make the unconscious conscious, like... Carl Jung said, right? So that we have more agency in our lives. I love that. Um, I mean, this, this, is, this is absolutely amazing. Do you get any pushback from some of the, I mean, I've kind of asked this a question, I'll ask it again, but do you get pushback from some of the clients that you work with when you're doing even just, you know, techniques and practices like this that are not quote unquote spiritual, but maybe are, I, I judge a little more touchy feely than the average business person would experience. What sort of, what sort of reaction or response do you get with some of the people that you work with? Well, yeah, you do. I mean, um, one of the things I try and get people to do is do cold showers. Uh, one of my clients, Adele, he, he, he gave me a, a LinkedIn recommendation. Um, he said he can't get around the idea of a cold shower in the morning. Um, but I, I find it exhilarating and I, I find it, you know, you start the day with yourself, you turn in the shower on cold and you sit there for, you know, whatever, three minutes or whatever. Uh, and you feel like a badass. You set yourself outside of your comfort zone. So you're bound then to take a little bit more risk in life. You're bound to push yourself a little bit further in life. Um, but yeah, I do get pushed back. You know, I, I try and encourage people to do gratitude statements written down every single day. And people do it maybe for a week and then think, oh, you know, I can't be bothered anymore. But actually, it's exactly like going to the gym, right? So if you go to the gym, you've got some muscles, I can see. You know, if you don't keep pumping the muscles, those, they're not going to be there. So you need to keep, you know, pumping and keep doing the brain uh, exercises as well. And the reason why I get people to do gratitude, for example, is if, you know, I don't know about you, but I've got children. And, um, you know, if you give a child a present and they're not grateful, do you feel like giving them anything else? Mm -hmm. Of course you don't, right? So why would the universe, God, or even your own subconscious make you feel worthy enough to receive everything else if you're not happy and grateful for what you have now in this moment? So like Dr. John Martini, who's a friend of mine, who's in the secret movie, the Law of Attraction movie, uh, and in the book, um, you know, I, I 
picked him up from his hotel quite often, bring him down to the radio station. We had lunch together. He's been in this house and all this kind of stuff. And, um, you know, he showed me his gratitude journal. It's like 5,000 pages. And his strap line is like, you know, if you think about it and you think about it, you bring about it. And he's living proof of it, as is every other, you know, successful coaches as well. So I think it's really important to do these things, you know, like we do when we go to the gym, we need to create these neuroplastic kind of changes or traits within our subconscious so that we do this consistently. If you had to boil everything down that we just spoke about into, into one sentence, and this is what I call internal leverage, this concept that, it, you know, success is an inside job. What would it be? Would it be that the, the key to success in, in life and business and spirituality is to optimize your energy? Or do you have something more interesting to, to phrase that with? Yeah, pretty much. Um, so again, I'll go back to what I said earlier on. It's like everything in this world, in this universe is energy. Thoughts are energy. Speech is energy. Thoughts lead to speech. Speech leads to actions. Actions leads to habits and habits leads to destiny. So think smart, talk smart, work smart. And if you're really, really smart, you'll get in touch with me for some coaching, consulting or corporate training. I was just about to ask, how can people find you <laughs> or follow up with you? Um, well, yeah, so LinkedIn is one of my biggest things um, that I utilize. Uh, since Clubhouse has been going, I've been you know, obviously on there a lot as well. And I do a lot of um, coaching on Clubhouse. I do, I literally just came off a mental health um marathon for 14 hours yesterday uh helping a lot of people i was on there you know just to, just to clarify you know i was on there with three psychologists three psychiatrists and a couple of other mindset coaches and you know these guys are properly trained psychologists and psychiatrists and they are contacting me offline saying where did you come up with that idea where did you come up with this idea you know and all that kind of stuff and i'm saying well life experience you know um so life experience can also be you know very very powerful in terms of what you do obviously you know i have done coaching courses many of them um and many types as well both sports business and life coaching courses um but i think you know life experiences can really add value to a lot of people and, and, and help you learn beautiful and tell us again the, the title of the book that is gonna be released very soon yeah, so it's high performance success without stress. I also have an online course um, at uh, training.dougdgordon, Gordon's G O R D O N, training.dougdgordon.com. Uh, and I've got three websites. One is D uh, uh, DS, uh, Delta Sierra Performance Optimization. It's spelt, the, the optimization is spelt the English way. So it's uh, an S rather than a Z, uh, dot com, DS Performance Optimization.com. I've also got DougDGordon.com. And I've got bodyhealthandsoul.com as well. Beautiful. Awesome. Well, Doug, it's always a pleasure talking to you. And thanks for stopping by. Likewise. Great to see you, everyone. Take care.